let's go talk about AI and optimizing customer journeys. Yes. Let's start with introductions then. Uh, I am Kamal Mehman. I work as a machine learning engineer in Frostmo. Uh, we have been building uh, artificial intelligence models for uh, online gambling uh, clients here for quite some time. And today I'm really excited to talk about how actually AI is impacting the industry and how it works, some details, uh, some abstract stuff. So looking forward to it. Cool. And we have Matthias as a special guest from our London office, working with most of the gaming and sports betting and iGaming customers we have globally. So Matthias, would you say hi? Right. Hello, everybody. Well, unfortunately, I'm via link, but let's see. Let's see how it goes. So, so yes, indeed, I've been working with Kamal um, with some ML and AI cases that we have done in the past. Um, uh, uh, yes, indeed, uh, mostly them from the uh, from the sort of uh, from the client uh, facing side. Uh, whereas then, of course, Kamal has, has done the, uh, the the heavy lifting, if you will. The uh, is the uh, He's the expert uh, here, so if you have any really tricky questions, then I'll, I'll direct them to, to come out straight away. So. Cool. And my name is Timo Luoto. I'm senior advisor in Frosmo, and basically I'm just keeping the talk here up and running. These guys are actually doing all the hard work and, and smart stuff, so let's see how we go. But we're ready to continue? Yes, sure. Sure. So, um, Quick recap of the topics. Um, let's say a few words about AI and developing AI in general, and, and Frosmos take our take on it. And then we are focusing solely on gaming and betting today. So we little bit check how AI has creeping into the business past few years, and obviously how we've been influencing it greatly during the same development. Kamal is going to explain all the really hard stuff about it. <laughs> and then me and Matthias are trying to shoot a few examples. And in the end, we go into the more practical stuff, also showing how we deal with the customer journey, identification, and, and well, enhancing the overall experience. Exactly. Take it away. Um, uh, it's good to, to take a look at the terminology. It doesn't sound so fun, but I think it's pretty, pretty important in the, uh, in the context, because uh, one purpose of why why we do these webinars is uh, to demystify perhaps AI a little bit because there's a lot of misconceptions and around uh, what AI is and how it can be used and how it should be used and so forth. Uh, most of them being quite wrong and, and maybe even exaggerated. Um, so, so I think it's, it's important to sort of like explain where, where we stand on, on AI today as in not just us in Frostmo, but rather sort of like what, what, where AS, AI has taken us so far uh, in general. And I think that perhaps the, the biggest confusion or the biggest misconception uh, with AI is that it often gets confused with AGI, which um, AI stands, of course, for artificial intelligence, whereas AGI stands for artificial general intelligence. Now, AGI, artificial general intelligence, is kind of the stuff that we see in sci-fi movies with, with um, uh, robots and, um, uh, and, and machines that can think and feel and just, um, can produce thoughts and ideas just like humans, can interact with humans without any, any sort of um, uh, friction, uh, which, which is obviously, well, we're far, we're far away from that still. I mean, we're not on a global scale, we're nowhere close to getting there yet. So, 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 and that's kind of like the holy grail, kind of like where AI is going, perhaps, uh, to evolve to one side, uh, to some, some people's delight, uh, but to the fear of others, perhaps. But we're, we're still far away. So at the, at the current stage, AI and AI applications will still need humans uh, to, 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 um, to sort of uh, tell them what to do first and foremost, uh, foremost and also indeed to to set the scenarios and uh, verify that that, um, that they're correct afterwards. So so currently, anyways, um, I'd say that that if we look at this, the boxes here on the up on the slide, um, I guess that that currently ML AI stands far closer to 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 statistics and sort of like 
uh, mathematical applications than it does to a general intelligence, uh, actual consciousness, just to make that clear. Uh, and 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 I just wanna, if if any of the academia out there has joined us or tuned in for this uh, for this webinar this morning, I just want to make make clear that ML2 uh, machine learning is a very sort of way very fuzzy term. Um, it's, it's it's technically it's a blanket, and we use it as a blanket term uh, for for all kinds of things like computer vision, robotics, neural networks, all kinds of different things. But, but we just uh, carelessly use it interchangeably with uh, AI. So essentially, when we say ML, we many times mean AI and, and vice versa. So let's like get two, two sort of like um, uh, up on, the, um, on, the, um, on the terminology. We, we, we are using them wrong, but we're aware of it as well. So just here. But that's pretty academia out there if they're, if they're listening in. So, so, so. Thanks. Well, I think for the rest of the <clears throat> show, we'll keep the academics more unhappy and, mm -hmm. and we get the customers happier and, and go focus on the, what happens in real life. True that, true that, so yeah, <clears throat> and and yeah, and it's um, so yeah, so AI <clears throat> is evolving. It's still far away from from reaching that holy grail kind of a, of consciousness, but nonetheless, it's very important because um, because because uh, as a computer and processing capacity grows, uh, the capabilities and the applications of AI are grows in tandem as well. So it is becoming uh, more powerful uh, all the time. Uh, the applications are, are becoming more, um, uh, more general, some, uh, general and more co uh, consumer, close to the consumer, so that we can actually now start to see and feel uh, what, what AI does. I mean, you know, self-driving cars is obviously something that's, that's on, the, uh, that's on uh, a hot topic these, uh, these are days, most certainly. So. So, um, but why is it then such a hot topic in uh, online gambling um, is one question to be asked. And um, I think it's, it's a, it's a, two, a two-sided story that really. Um, one, one reason why it's so big in gambling is because uh, gambling is games uh, and games have rules and machines like rules. So essentially by programming machines, we can, we can have them learn to play the games uh, within those rule sets and actually get better at, at the games. This, is, this, is, this has been going on essentially since, since uh, Gary Kasparov got beaten in, uh, in chess by, by a computer uh, decades ago already. And, and yes, uh, computers can beat us at, at most games, including chess and Go these days. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to. So if we're talking about a, an, a gaming environment in the context of entertainment, then using AI, creating a AI for playing a game can actually be um, uh, used to create a more immersive, more, more fun experience for the user. So, so that's, that's, that's from the sort of like the, the game's perspective why ML AI is such a huge topic in, in, uh, in uh, online gambling these days. Then, if we look at it from from the user's perspective, in that sense, then then um, so data is key uh, for all ML tasks. You need the data, and you need lots of it. Uh, now, online gambling is good in that sense because there's the transactions are so frequent. There's so many transactions going on. I mean, if you compare with e-commerce, for example, um, a transaction, an actual transaction, might happen once for six months or even less. But obviously, in online wagering, there can be hundreds of transactions for one user in one session. So data accrues extremely fast. Um, and nevertheless, it has been for, for, for ages, as long as, as, as casinos went online, I suppose. So there's huge data repositories sitting out there, not being used for anything, essentially, that can be used um, to produce uh, models and algorithms um, uh, in the um, AI space to, to um, uh, to, uh, to tackle some of these, or sort of like, um, maybe not tackle, but, but rather contribute to some of these mega trends that are listed uh, on the slide here. So essentially, if we're talking about user journeys and a, a better UX, you can use AI to create uh, a feeling that the casino that you visit is, 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 is um, tailored to you, that it's your casino. Um, um, you know, we obviously fraud attempts and stuff like this, getting rid of um, uh, 
uh, getting rid of um, bots that play the poker tables, which is obviously something that is that, that benefits everybody um, involved uh, in the um, in the scene. So so yeah, so it is it is an important topic already today, even if it is evolving and it, it will be evolving and it's going to be more powerful over the edge. But but this is a good time to 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 um, start with it and get introduced to it already now. Okay. Um, before we go forward, I'm just going to say to our audience that if you have questions and if you're asking for examples, then we'll come to that a bit later. Um, I will use my own discretion if I want to interrupt these guys explaining and, uh, and fill in your questions. But keep still shooting the questions because we'll address in the end for our short Q&A, of course. Sorry. Let's continue. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so if uh, I think that, that next we'll jump to the process of it actually and sort of like see how it's all done, uh, we'll get back, we'll definitely have more examples from, from uh, AI in the real world. But let's take a look at how it actually works in the uh, background. Yeah. So, this is where the things actually start to work. Uh, as Matthias said earlier, that data <coughs> is the key. It's the uh, basic building block. So we start by collecting it, uh, either through uh, Frostmos capabilities of advanced tracking and Frostmos data pipeline, or indirectly through uh, client systems, which we then ingest into Frostmos data pipeline. Once this data is collected, uh, of course, it's not exactly in the format that we need, and uh, most of the time it's raw and includes uh, a lot of things that uh, we might have to discard or a lot of things that we might have to keep. So then we uh, go through a pre-processing phase, try to clean it, normalize it, and uh, do the feature selection and feature engineering. But basically at this point we should already know our objective because uh, the data that we are cleaning or processing uh, cannot be done uh, with ob without the objective in the context. For example, like uh, uh, the data cleaning for a deposit amount prediction case would be drastically different from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a case in which we are trying to predict the addictive users uh, or, or uh, so on. Hence, we should know our objective quite clearly at this point, and uh, keeping that into uh, in mind, we go forward with this cleaning and normalization of the data. And once we have a, a clean data set to work on, after this uh, second step in the process, uh, that's when we actually start uh, uh, training a machine or uh, start the machine learning process from the data set that we have on. So uh, in our jargon on terminology, we usually use the word a model. A model is basically uh, a computer program which uh, finds patterns in the data and uh, we experiment with different kind of, uh, of models in order to see which one is the best fit, which one is going to work the best. So this finding the right model is the place where all the training, learning, and, and optimization takes place. Uh, once we have a model uh, which is satisfactory enough, uh, giving us our, our good results, we're going to actually talk more about it later in, in, in the webinar, that what exactly does it mean by good results. But once we have those, uh, the, those models set up, we then uh, churn out the, the outputs from the model. For example, if there are uh, predictions or user lists or uh, some kind of probabilities for certain actions. Once we have uh, those outputs in place, we then uh, move them to either the clients directly or through the Frostmo platform uh, on the client's website. So I think uh, in that uh, aspect, uh, Timo would uh, enlighten you more like how exactly Frostmo platform actually enables us to do it faster and way more efficiently than. Yeah, well, as we said in, uh, in the end, we're gonna go through practical examples of what we already done and delivered to our customers but if we summarize the whole process what Kamal just explained is that once we have the objectives from our customers and you know first preset the goals that you know what are we looking for to whom are we targeting then we clean the data then we do the models and try to experiment in different kind of models exactly and out of this all this data we do all this work to get the insight from the data and that insight is either provided to the customer as it is if they are able to do something themselves, it can be also related to the offline business and, and uh, they can have already some their own like CRM based solutions existing. Or simply we can create targeted groups and segments based on the 
audiences found or the patterns found in the data model and then target them as we want to. Like a classic example of class customer churns or VIP treatment, we can decide different kind of paths and customer journeys based on the probability. So we don't know that they are exactly VIPs yet or that they are going to churn exactly, but we have, for example, at best case 90% probability that these are going to be churning out in a certain time span. Thus, we target these people who fit this model and try to, of course, retain them. Yes. So it's basically a prediction. So <clears throat> we have a way to early act early uh, on those uh, uh, predictions and, and insights from the data. Yeah. We can essentially, what you're saying, target a user before they um, jump over to a different service, before they switch over to a different service, actually target them and, and make sure that they are. Uh, they stay there. So that's, that's, that's just one nice application of uh, using AI indeed. And, and yeah, so data um, is key. Uh, data is the new oil, um, is an expression used frequently these days. Um, so I, and I think it sort of, it, it really describes it well in the sense that we have all those repositories sitting there with all that data, with all that oil uh, being untapped. So, 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 so it's, it's so much sort of like uh, going to waste, if you will, because it's not being used properly. Um, and and even if the data hasn't been collected yet, then then uh, Frostmo can be used as a great tool indeed for or uh, for anonymously then collecting the uh, the user data that's that's needed for the models, so that so that we can um, uh, so it, essentially the interactions that happens on the site we can we can then track again. And, uh, and build up the repository of data so that these um, uh, machine learning models can, can then be put in, uh, into production, indeed. Yeah, I, I really love the example of the data as an oil because um, the same way than the oil you pump the raw oil from the ground. I mean, data itself, I always say, it's actually a burden because there is so much of it and the raw data is not usable to anyone. It's such a huge work yeah. to turn that oil into the gasoline running the cars and that's what we do. We churn through all that data to bring the insight that then runs the business as the oil gas would run the car and all that. So exactly. I think it's a good anecdote. Exactly. So now we actually move to uh, the magic, how actually a machine learns. Uh, what uh, exactly is happening behind the scenes and how a machine is actually able to, to, to find uh, stuff in the data, uh, fit certain uh, patterns and then predict based on it. So let's move. So how exactly a machine learns? As uh, we have been talking about, machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence. So there is some intelligence involved there one way or another. Uh, uh, a machine basically finds a pattern in the data available to it, but uh, when it sees a pattern, it adjusts itself. That's what we call learning, and uh, that is what a model does, a machine learning model does. So, for example, uh, it has seen a certain uh, uh, trend in, in, in certain uh, data points. The machine is able to, to fit itself uh, to those patterns that it can uh, actually extrapolate itself in the future that how things are going to go from this point onwards. So when it sees a pattern, it's, uh, it says it adjusts the program to reflect what it found. The more data underlying a pattern we expose to the machine, the better it gets. That is essentially from where uh, this, uh, this notion of the more the data, the better it gets comes from. And that's how we emphasize a lot on, on, on uh, uh, the quality and the quantity of the data. So even though there is uh, nothing interesting in the data, that itself is interesting uh, that we haven't found anything because uh, that will make the machine learn uh, in a way that this is not the way uh, to go, but there might be other patterns available somewhere else. Hence, the more data underlying a pattern we expose, the more better it gets. When a model is properly fitted uh, to this pattern, and we have uh, done enough training or enough learning to see uh, that the predictions are good enough, then is actually uh, when the model uh, starts to uh, foresight things in the future. That standing on today, what's going to happen in a week, in a month, or uh, if we are uh, seeing certain uh, 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 patterns or certain uh, trends from a user, is the user is going to be a VIP, 
uh, are these behavioral patterns uh, suggesting that at some point the user is becoming uh, uh, an addict or certain transactions or the manners that they have been done, do they constitute a fraud already or is there like a chance that these might lead to a fraud uh, transaction, so should we stop them early? So basically a uh, machine is uh, uh, predicting stuff uh, in future and we do have evaluation metrics to how to improve them and how to, to optimize these, uh, these predictions. So just in a little bit of more detail, if we go, so for example, let's uh, take a case of uh, identification of a, a VIP user. Uh, the point being is how a machine is better than human intuition and how can it works in an automated way so that no human intervention is actually involved. Let's consider uh, as a case in which a user deposits, uh, for example, 5,000 euros or $5,000 uh, as, as a deposit. And uh, we set a statistical criteria that uh, a user who does this amount of uh, deposit is actually a VIP. And it makes uh, intuitive sense that this big of a deposit might be very well meaning that this guy uh, is a VIP user. But that can also mean a lot of other things. This one simple factor does not actually uh, uh, concretely uh, describe that the user is a VIP. It can also mean that uh, this guy is a bonus hunter. It can also mean that uh, uh, this is a one-time player and won't come back uh, again after losing or winnings. So uh, the decision boundary uh, for these kind of, uh, of criteria, uh, simple statistical criteria, is quite uh, uh, linear and quite simple. As you can see uh, in the image, we just divide the users who have deposited 5,000 and the people who have not. So this actually doesn't work in real world. It's not quite pragmatic in nature because there are multitudes of factors which actually affect uh, a user journey to become a VIP. Uh, as I said, it's not really a representative of real world, it's like not pragmatic in nature. Hence, uh, that's where uh, the machine learning comes in. There are numerous features, there are numerous behavioral traits, there are <coughs> numerous uh, uh, users' uh, interaction with the system, the time it spends, and a lot of other features which actually increase the complexity of this decision boundary in which we are uh, uh, classifying a user to be a VIP or not. So hence, uh, you see, like even if like there are three factors or four factors, we can uh, fit uh, a three D plane as you're seeing in the picture through an Excel sheet. No machine learning is required there. It's quite simple statistics and frequency uh, uh, methods. But that again is not practical in nature. That's not what actually we have seen happening in, in real world. So then, where the actual uh, magic of the machine learning uh, gets in, and uh, we do the dimensionality reduction. Basically, that's, I think, uh, in a nutshell, can be said in an academic sense that machine learning is basically dimensionality reduction uh, in general. We have multitudes, dozens and dozens of features. We, try, uh, we are trying to learn a certain case that to predict if a user, based on all these attributes, is going to be a VIP or not. Now, all these factors come in, and we uh, uh, try to learn a decision boundary which is not as simple as a linear line or a 3D plane. It's quite complex in nature as you can see uh, in these images. Uh, in the middle one is actually a 7D plane which, is, uh, which has learned through dozens of factors in a way that it can fit itself to all of these, uh, these uh, possibilities. So, For example, if a user is actually uh, depositing a money at a certain time and are not withdrawing the money uh, for this quite period of a time, actually has this amount of bet count, uh, has these behavioral traits or these clicks or, 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 or these kind of features, then all of them are actually contributing uh, to the probability of the user becoming a VIP. Hence, uh, machine learning basically is dimensionality reduction to a sense in which we fit the model to a certain pattern and then uh, do the, the predictions based on it. So just for those guys like me who really <laughs> need to focus on what they actually means a 7D model yes. or 7D scape, so mm -hmm. um, you actually have to explain what is 7D scape to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. so yeah, basically like if, uh, if we can go back uh, uh, on a slide a little bit, uh, it's actually not possible to uh, uh, visualize a 7D plane on a 2D screen. But as you can see in the, uh, in the uh, cube uh, yeah. uh, picture below, that is a 3D plane. So you can see that there are three different factors which are impacting this decision boundary and uh, dividing the users between being VIPs or not. Let's imagine that there are four more dimensions to these three, three different planes. 
So a plane would not be uh, uh, that simple. It will be a curved around these, these uh, different features so that when a, a new user or a user that we need to uh, uh, predict comes in, we take that user's uh, uh, attributes, fit it into this model, and see is the user uh, lying below the plane or above the plane. That means if the user is probable to be a VIP or not. And if it's lying above the plane, then how exactly far away it is from uh, that one specific point. Then what we say that it's the user 90% uh, probable, 80% probable, or actually it's just 20% probable that he's going to be a VIP. So this is what basically I mean when I say that how uh, a 7D plane is yeah. making a decision bump. OK, so that's almost easier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to oversimplify it <laughs> even to myself now. Yeah. So obviously, as Kamal said earlier, suffice to say that should we only decide the uh, VIPs deposit size and yeah. bedding size and maybe a, some, a couple of factors of risk taking skill, we don't need machine learning for that. Yeah. That's, that's something a, a experienced player with a, or a host with an Excel sheet can do. Can do it, yeah. What we are talking about is that we have multitude of parameters and attributes we can follow, exactly. traits and behavior models where we go to dozens of different versions and then comparing these we can find something that intuition doesn't maybe even even give what you any idea what's going on. It can be even group of elements mm -hmm. or you know features that actually are similar to VIPs even before they do the big deposits. Exactly. Engage. Okay, That's that much point. I can understand. Yeah. Okay, can I also uh, ask a few questions of Kamal to see <clears throat> if I understood it correctly. Um, so, so essentially, so you have all this data. Uh, that's the first step, obviously. Uh, then, but then in practical terms, so I guess that the next thing to do, even if we're talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence, is still to set then a scenario. So you still want to sort of have something that you're looking for in the data. And, and then the learning, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is essentially happening when the machine gets better at identifying whatever is in the scenario that we're looking for. So I guess the learning doesn't really mean that a machine randomly learns anything and just spits out um, uh, results into how we should change our marketing strategy. But rather, the, the learning parts happen when the machine gets better at identifying these key things, these key scenarios that we think are important, for example, when we set up a uh, marketing strategy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. That's, that's exactly what uh, the point is, uh, that in supervised machine learning, uh, we need to have an objective uh, as clearly defined as possible. And that is the objective uh, which we take and uh, build our models to. And when we talk about machine learning, it's not that the machine is coming up with uh, random stuff uh, that, okay, uh, these are, are, are the things. But it is uh, how well it is fitting uh, to those uh, uh, data attributes to predict the objective that we have in mind. So as I said, the VIP user, this learning of this plane, uh, this 70 plane, or this decision boundary, it's what uh, the machine is learning. So once it has this decision boundary in, in place, then it can easily predict uh, with uh, a confidence score that that's uh, how the objective would turn out to be. So that's why customers need someone like us. I mean, every, exactly. every model is built for the specific goal. You, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are not where well, Matthias said that we will be in the future when we have these general AIs where you can just ask a question and, and this huge neural network we san will answer you like, Way beyond Siri, that is. But yeah, okay. But then we and then we can take that when we do have the scenarios, we can take them. So, for example, the VIP scenario that you that you were describing over here. So essentially, um, then so we do the machine will tell us with the highest uh, accuracy possible then uh, which new users um, we think are going to become actual top tier users. And then we can actually exclude those, or rather the other way around from those, exclude then the ones that we think are just bonus hunters. So, so that then obviously uh, marketing and, and uh, customer engagement campaigns can be directed uh, much more efficiently towards people that we actually think um, are going to bring value to the company and are actually going to enjoy doing the service, uh, enjoy uh, using the service rather than just um, coming in for the, um, uh, for the bonus and the, the, uh, the sort of like the, the quick win, if you will. 
uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So moving on, uh, I think we still would like to talk yep. a bit about uh, uh, how we know our model works. So as I was talking earlier uh, in a slide that uh, when we uh, just simply say that, uh, okay, now the model is good enough to be put in production and uh, is churning out good results, what exactly does it mean? Like a model is good or a machine has learned well enough. We need to have some uh, uh, quantitative uh, metrics in order to say that, okay, the accuracy is 76% or the accuracy is 85%, 90%. So uh, how does that work? Basically, uh, it's a bit in the detail that we do a train test split on the data. So once we have the data set uh, clean, we divide it into uh, two parts, uh, a bigger proportion, let's say 70% uh, on the testing, uh, on the training side, sorry, and a 30% on the testing side. We never show the model that 30% of the testing data. All the training and learning is done on that 70%. Once the model is trained and fitted on that 70%, we then filter or put this testing data through that model to see that what the model is predicting, how far away those predictions are from what actually happened. Because that is the data that we already have. So that gap or that difference or that error margin between the predicted versus the actual is actually what constitutes the accuracy of a model. That's what we mean when we say train test split and cross-validation uh, uh, in a sense. So we do have these uh, evaluation metrics uh, in which uh, there is uh, the seen and the unseen data uh, towards the model in order to check how good it's doing. Then we have a cross-validation approach which is like going back in time and see uh, what we predicted is actually happening in current future on which we are standing at right now. So uh, then we uh, also check how many false positives the model is giving out, how many false negatives are there, depending on the objective which we need to reduce or which we need to, to increase. So uh, in that context, uh, this is when we are uh, optimizing the model during its uh, learning and training. Uh, there are some buzzwords in the machine learning uh, community or uh, in general of overfitting or underfitting a model. This is where they come from. So if we are training uh, a model on the training set and we train it so well that the model learns everything from the training data, but when it's actually seen some unseen stuff from the testing uh, data set, it doesn't give out good results. That actually means that we have overfitted our model on the training set and we need to keep the, uh, the margin levels so that it has uh, uh, the possibility to accommodate new or unseen stuff and it still do predictions well enough. So that is like the overfitting, underfitting scenario in there. Then again, uh, as uh, uh, we have been uh, talking about since the beginning, that we are not yet able to reach the artificial general intelligence. So there always is a need for manual intervention, a human eye to look after the things and like o overlook uh, all these, uh, these processes. So then where the sanity test comes in, in which we check if the model is uh, actually not being totally uh, unreasonable in some cases, or we do manual uh, validation uh, to see if the things are, are, are working uh, well enough or not. And uh, there is also a very uh, good mechanism of A-B testing. As we said earlier that we uh, compare different models. So in order to, uh, instead of comparing them on the data, we actually put them out there in the production and do A-B testing. For example, we have like uh, uh, five different models of recommendation. One is based on, based on natural language processing, other is just trending, uh, a third one is on collaborative filtering based models. We just put these models out there and do the A-B testing on different uh, populations of users and then see which one is giving out the best results and then go on, uh, carry on with that model. So this is how uh, uh, we actually evaluate the, the machine learning models or how exactly they are doing out there in the uh, uh, in the system in the production level. Yeah, so obviously we can we can recognize not just patterns in the data, but mm. hopefully we find a way to match those patterns into the behavior of real people yes. and their preferences. Obviously, we are talking about probabilities. Exactly. So we can recognize preferences of people, their habits, and all that. It's probabilities. Same way we can see recognize probabilities of these may be belong to certain group mm -hmm. in the future, mm -hmm. but it's all about trying to be proactive. Mm -hmm. So that's where we need. And if we go to probabilities, I'm always going to ask the numbers. So how yeah. accurate we can then be? Yes. And then we go to the real results, exactly. the real life examples. Exactly. So I'm going to continue this first topic of, of 
probabilities. Um, and I'm going to choose the churn model because I know about that a little bit yes. myself. Yeah. So how far have we got? I mean, how far or how probable we have been able to identify from our customers? And now we're talking about solutions we have delivered. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are not going to say which customers, yeah. but we can talk about the solutions themselves. Exactly. Uh, so here at Frostmo, uh, we specialize uh, really well in at least churn prediction models and VIP prediction models. So the churn prediction model uh, that the Frostmo uh, has built for uh, certain customers, which I cannot name obviously, is uh, above 90% uh, accurate uh, in all cases. And it has been evaluated and uh, tested uh, uh, in, in, in different means. So uh, churn is something which we uh, do really well. And it's also really essential for businesses actually because uh, in online gambling industry, uh, the churn frequency is uh, quite heavy. So it's really essential uh, for uh, business decision makers to know well ahead in time. It's not churn prediction, it's early churn prediction. So we are actually giving out probabilities uh, of something happening in the future. So if we know that there is a huge user base which can be retained by certain modifications from Frostmore, if they, we, can, we can put into some segments, uh, put up some segmentation there and show them little uh, modifications or target them with marketing emails or any such business decision ventures to keep them uh, on the platform, that is really essential for any business. So we do early churn prediction in order to help these user retention. Yeah, and the, what I love part about the machine learning, about the machine part of learning is that when you have this model done, when the iterations have given us the over 90% accuracy, so in simply, we can say with 90% accuracy of certain behavior models, though, those who hit these models are actually going to, well, are in a high risk yeah. of churning. And if we don't do anything with a 90% probability, they will churn out from your service. Exactly. And since it's a machine, when we have this model implemented, we, for example, use Frosmo to tag these people and then provide, as you said, we can, we can use marketing automation, we can use real-time things on a, on a game mm -hmm. environment itself and all that. It's there always on. You can just leave it there because it's, it will keep constantly analyzing, it will constantly keep tagging. So after this, you can keep running it for a year or two or yes. how many years, and it's always having that. Yeah. Obviously, you can then try to tune it into the trends or do some kind of like a recheck or remodeling mm -hmm. the data to mm -hmm. see that, you know, has trends changed or something yes. else. But again, there can be so many different attributes that we use to recognize. It's again, it's not just the activity or you know how often they come or if they've started to maybe change the source they're coming from or all that. Exactly. There can be, I don't know. A lot of possibilities. A lot and, of possibilities. And I would li also uh, like to mention that uh, unlike uh, usual software uh, like websites or, 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 or applications, machine learning models are really very really low maintenance. So even though they take uh, quite some effort to build up, but once they are out there in the production, uh, they are learning by themselves. And also uh, they don't require that level of, of tweaking or that level of maintenance or changing as other software applications do. So it's a uh, 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 one-time uh, uh, big effort, but goes on quite well and uh, gives out quite good yeah. uh, uh, returns. So Matthias, you have been the one to also have the fortunate position, collect all the fame and thank you and gratitude of certain customers. So would you tell us a little bit about the VIP model? I mean, what we actually done and delivered so far? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's obviously similar um, in that. Well, I mean, you know, we, we spoke about it quite a lot already. I think that, that maybe the, the, the sort of like the main takeaway with the VIP model is indeed uh, the ability to to exclude like the actual good users for your service um, from from indeed the bonus hunters and the um, the ones that aren't that aren't gonna participate or be engaged in your service anyways, so that you can actually see to it that they get a better um, experience. It, it is related indeed to the churn model um, in the sense that 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 uh, obviously switchover costs um, in uh, online gambling are really low as in um you know taking uh taking up an account in one uh, one service um me doesn't mean that it would make it any sort of like more harder to take up an account in a different service so the switchover codes are, costs are really low to sort of transfer from one to the other 
So, so with both VIP and churn, I mean, what, what we want to do essentially is, is, of course, make sure that, uh, that users stay on your service, that they don't take up, uh, that they don't uh, take up an account on a different service or sort of take their business elsewhere. So, so, so they are related in the sense that, uh, that we want to want to make sure that, that we can keep them keep them to your service and not not switch over to anybody else's. Um, mm -mm. I suppose that 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 we if, if we consider churn um, as in as in sort of like a generalized model, then VIP is of course then for top tier users. So I guess another takeaway from that could be that this also helps uh, marketing managers and marketing 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 decision makers. Um, what the spend should be on these different user groups. Um, so, of course, if we're talking about top tier members, then, then obviously the spend to keep them can be higher than than, uh, than the uh, than the average member. So this is obviously very important when it comes to setting budgets and um, and uh, and whatnot for for the marketing efforts. So, so yeah, but it's it's all about making sure that they stay with with your service, that they don't um, uh, that they don't sort of try their luck in a different uh, at a different provider, but rather stay stay with you. That's that's what. Uh, that's what it's all about, indeed. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I was a bit hassling with the with the tool here, but um, I have some special positions. This has been I've been listening and following these guys, so something um, we are running definitely over time a yeah, lot. Exactly. So I'm just gonna <laughs> quickly summarize something about the VIP model, which actually mm. I was super surprised when when we actually delivered to a customer that how quickly we were able to actually recognize. Uh, the VIPs that then later on became VIPs. I mean, normally it can take you, if you th go to offline casino and, and you, are, you, you are never heard in the beginning, it can take you months to actually recognize those people who are regular and, and they have like deeper pockets and they play continuously and, and mm -hmm. in a long term, not just, you know, coming there in a party and, and crash and yeah. burn in a, in a month. Yeah. But after having like, in a gen model, like having like dozens of different attributes to recognize VIPs, how long did it take for us? I'll get let you to tell the time, but how long did it take to recognize the VIP patterns from new users? Uh, our minimum uh, recommendation is that we at least need three days of interaction of the system, which is quite low. We actually have worked quite hard to to reach uh, to that point uh, because, like, uh, users uh, need to be identified early in order to be given uh, campaigns and marketing material and stuff. So at least three days of user interaction uh, with the system, and we are already uh, be able to predict uh, with some confidence score if the guy is gonna be a VIP or not. So uh, of course, as more the data, uh, as better it is, but the minimum uh, criteria Timo, is three days of interaction at least. Yeah, sorry, I'm really bad at this, but. Yeah. <laughs> anyways, um, so, uh, we're going to summarize on basically that. I know that everybody there, or at least those who are working on the industry, mm -hmm. are thinking that, you know, what are we getting from this? I mean, they are certainly doing their own tasks. They are watching CRM and they are watching the behavior. So they are already, we, many people already have ways to recognize VIPs. So mm -hmm. here is a challenge. Um, we are, unfortunately, <laughs> we went way over time. Uh, here is a question, actually, to you, to the audience. We are, there are so many topics about fraud detection and, and identify sales excursions recommendations, and, and, like recommendations and proactive uh, predictive recommendations and all that. So please give us some feedback to our, uh, you can see the marketing contact info and all that because we could actually turn this into a series of, of discussions yeah. about AI use and all that. Yeah. And a small challenge that can you actually identify uh, in three days of new users that they are going to become VIPs of long-term use and all that. So on that bombshell, yes. <laughs> stating that from Top Gear, I yeah. <laughs> love the show. Um, we uh, have to call it for now and, and uh, say that hopefully we'll see you in the next episode. Exactly. And if uh, you have any questions that you cannot think of right now or uh, anything comes up with any further discussions with uh, uh, somebody else, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we are always available. Uh, you will uh, find the uh, contact uh, email and uh, contact details yeah. in the slides next. And uh, very happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Or if you uh, want to discuss more about it, or uh, as Timo said, that if uh, the audience would like to see 
one certain case discussed in more detail, for example, the collaborative filtering or how the recommendations work, how do we recommend uh, games to the people based on natural language processing or the description of the games. Uh, we haven't talked that about much uh, uh, today. Yeah. Uh, or how exactly uh, we are uh, identifying addictive users or self-excluders uh, for the system. So if anything, uh, in more detail, please feel free to contact us or any questions, we'll be really happy to answer. Yeah. Just like machine learning, we can plan the, ne <laughs> plan the next session based on your goals, if exactly. questions. I hope I answered or I asked your questions from he these guys and, and if, well, no follow-up questions, so maybe you answered them all. Yeah. Until next time. Thank you.